thank you so much for joining me on this jockingly night. Yes, it was just stormy outside, and now it's calmed down, and I think it'd be a perfect time to do some scary So, on this dark and gloomy night, I will be reading the story for you. Um, one story from this book. It's called Autopsy on Four. I apologize. Autopsy Room 4. I've never read this book before, or this story from this book before. So, bear with me, my darlings. Okay. Autopsy Room 4. It's so dark that for a while, just how long, I don't know. I think I'm still unconscious. Then, slowly, it comes to me that unconscious people don't have a sensation of movement through the dark, accompanied by a faint rhythmic sound that can only be a squeaky nail. And I can feel contact from the top of my head to the balls of my heels. I can smell something that might be rubber. That is not unconsciousness. And there is something too, too what? Too rational about the sensation for it to be a dream. Then what is it? Who am I? And what's happening to me? The squeaky wheel quits its stupid rhythm and I stop moving. There is a crackle. There's a crackle around me from a rubber smell kind of stuff. A voice. Which one did they say? A pause. Second voice. Four, I think. Yeah, four. We start to move again. But more slowly, I can hear the faint scuff of feet now. Probably in soft-soled shoes, maybe sneakers. The owners of the voices are owners of the shoes. They stop me again. 
There's a thump, followed by a faint swoosh. Whoosh. It is, I think, the sound of a door, which a pneumatic hinge being opened. What's going on in here? I yell. But the yell is only in my head. My lips don't move. I can feel them, and my tongue, lying on the floor of my mouth like a stunned mole. But I can't move them. The thing I'm on starts rolling again. A moving bed? Yes. A gurney, in other words. I've had some experience with them. A long... Long time ago, in Lyndon Johnson's... Beep! <laughs> little Asian adventure. There was a curse word and I didn't want to say a curse word on the internet. A beep little Asian adventure. It comes to me that I'm in a hospital, that something bad has happened to me. Something like the explosion that almost neutered me 33 years before and that I'm going to be operated on. There are a lot of answers in that idea sensible ones, for the most part. But I don't hurt anywhere. Except for the minor matter of being scared out of my wits, I feel fine. And if these are orderlies wheeling me into the operating room, why can't I see? Why can't I talk? A third voice. Over here, boys. My rolling bed is pushed in a new direction. And the question drumming in my head is, what kind of a mess have I gotten myself into? Doesn't that depend on who you are? I ask myself. That's one thing, at least. I find I do know. I ask myself. I'm Howard Cottrell. I'm a stockbroker known to some of my colleagues as Howard the Conqueror. Second voice, from just above my head. You're looking very pretty today, Doc. Fourth voice, female and cool. It's always nice to be validated by you, Rusty. Could you hurry up a little? The babysitter expects me back by seven. She's committed to dinner with her parents. Back by seven, back by seven. It's still the afternoon, maybe, or early evening, but black in here. Black as your hat. Black as the woodchucks. A-hole. Black as midnight in Persia. And what's going on? Where have I been? What have I been doing? Why haven't I been manning the phones? Because it's Saturday, a voice from far down murmurs. You were, were, a sound, walk, a sound I love, a sound I more or less live for, the sound of, what? The head of a golf club, of course, hitting a ball off the tee. I stand watching it fly off into the blue. I'm grabbed, shoulders and calves, and lifted. It startles me terribly, and I try to scream. No sound comes out. Or perhaps one does. A tiny squeak, much tinier than the one produced by the wheel below me. Probably not even that. Probably it's just my imagination. I'm swung through the air in an envelope of blackness. Don't draw me, I've got a bad black I've got bad back. I try to say. And again there's no movement of the lips or teeth. My tongue goes on lying on the floor of my mouth. The mole may be not just stunned, but dead. And now I have a terrible thought, one which spikes a fright a degree closer to panic. What if they put me down the wrong way? My tongue slides backwards and blocks my windpipe. I won't be able to breathe. That's what people mean when they say swallowed his tongue, isn't it? Second voice, Rusty. You'll like this one, Doc. He looks like Michael Bolton. Female Doc. Who's that? Third voice, sounds like a young man, not much more than a teenager. He's this white lounger singer who wants to be black. I don't think this is him. There's laughter at that. The female voice joining in. A little doubtfully, and as 
and as I am set down on what feels like a padded table, Rusty starts some new crack. He's got a whole stand-up routine, it seems. I lose this bit of hilarity in a burst of sudden horror. I won't be able to breathe if my tongue blocks my windpipe. That's the thought which has gone through my head. But what if I'm not breathing now? It fits. It fits everything with a horror. Horrid snugness. The dark. The rubbery smell. Nowadays, I am Howard the Conqueror. Stockbroker extraordinaire. Terror of Dairy Country Club. But in 1979, I was a part of the medical assistance team in Mekong Delta, a scared kid who sometimes woke up wet-eyed from the dreams of the family dog. And all at once, I knew this feel, this smell. Dear God, I'm in a body bag. First voice, want to sign this doc? Remember to bear down hard. It's just, it's three copies. Sound of a pin scraping away on paper. I imagine the owner of the first voice holding out a clipboard to the wound doctor. Oh dear Jesus, let me not be dead and try to scream. And nothing comes out. I'm breathing though, aren't I? I mean, I can't feel myself doing it. But my lungs... <clears throat> Excuse me. But my lungs seem okay. They're not throbbing or yelling for air the way they do when you swim too far underwater. So I must be okay, right? Except if you're dead, the deep voice murmurs. They wouldn't be crying out for air, would they? No, because dead lungs don't need to breathe. Dead lungs can kind of just take Rusty, what are you doing next Saturday night, Doc? But if, I'm my de but if I'm dead, how can I feel? How can I smell the bag I'm in? How can I bear these voices? The Doc now saying that next Saturday night she's going to be shampooing her dog, which is named Rusty. What a coincidence. And all of them laughing? If I'm dead, why aren't I either gone or in the white light they've always talked about on Oprah? There's a harsh, ripping sound, and all at once, I am in a white light. It is blinding, with the sun breaking through a scrim of clouds on a winter day. I try to squint my eyes shut against it, but nothing happens. My eyelids are like blinds on broken rollers. A face bends over me, blocking off part of the glare, which comes not from a dazzling astral plane, but from a bank of overhead fluorescence. The face belongs to a young, conventional, conventionally handsome man of about 25. He looks like one of those beach beefcakes on Baywatch or Melrose Plays. Marginally smart, smarter, though. He's got a lot of dark black hair under a curiously worn surgical green cap. He, he's wearing a tunic, too. His eyes are blue, the sort of eyes girls die for. There are dusty arcs of freckles high upon his cheekbones. Hey gosh, he says, it's a third voice. This guy does look like Michael Bolton. A little long in the old tootharoo, maybe. He leans closer. One of the flat tie ribbons at the neck of his green tunic tickles against my forehead. But yeah, I see it. Hey, Michael, sing something. Help me, is what I'm trying to sing. But I can only look up into his dark blue eyes with my frozen dead man stare. I could only wonder if I am a dead man. If this is how it happens, if this is what everyone goes through after the punk quits. If I'm still alive, how come he hasn't seen my pupils contract when the light hit them? But I know the answer to that. Or I think I do. They didn't contract. That's why the glare from the fluorescence is so appealing. Well, 